It's our pleasure to bring you another episode of The Heart of the Matter, in which we feature Karen Young, who was once a beauty queen and who went through depression. So now, hear her story. We'll be back with it in a moment. These things sometimes are sad. I, I said it was a financial cost. As one of the many things was enormous. It was a God experience. I just wanted to see. find God. Simply feeling like you're in the fire. It isn't always your soul. Tell us about the solution. As one of People with 18 to 35 years of age start out of work. Hey, I don't have the skill for this particular problem to solve this particular problem. None of us talked about the bread seller. Welcome again to this episode of The Heart of Matter where I'm talking with Karen Young and we're talking about depression. Uh, Karen, you've been through the phase of beauty queen, you've been through the phase of media personality, let's, let's say celebrity, yes. and it's so difficult to understand how somebody who has been through these heights can face depression. Yes. And most people will be surprised that a beauty queen or ex-beauty queen could ever be depressed. Yes. So tell us about depression. Depression is something that um, is not giving as much attention as it should be given in this part of the world. It's, I hate to call it a mental Ill illness or a mental disorder because that has negative connotations, but that is that's actually what it is. It is a medical condition where you, um, you just feel this Lack, lack, there's, a, there's a lack of life in you. You have this lackluster approach to everything. You don't feel the fulfillment from what used to give you pleasure or whatnot. And then you start, before you know it, it even starts affecting your immune system because you start falling sick all the time. You're susceptible to colds and then you don't want to do anything. And then before you know it, you start having suicidal thoughts and you just want to end it all. You just want to go. So what, what I'm saying is most people won't imagine that somebody who is in the public eye a lot of the time can ever be depressed. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what do you think is the incidence of depression in, in a country like Nigeria? Is it an African problem? Is it a Nigerian problem? How big is this problem? This is a worldwide problem. Mm -hmm. But the difference between other countries and other developed countries in Nigeria is other countries, they know what depression is, they are aware of it, they accept it, they even have centers where you can get help. But Nigeria, we're still not fully accepting what depression is. Like, it's something that has a kind of stigma to it. Most people, most people don't even know they're depressed, the ones that are depressed. And the ones that do know they're depressed are too ashamed to say anything about it because they is don't Is it something that people should be ashamed of? No, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's like having a... It's like having a migraine. If you had a migraine and you were literally in pain, you don't think you'd be ashamed to go to the doctor and say, I'm sick, I need help. So, so now, let's talk about Karen. Okay. You got to the point where you realized something was wrong. Yes. Take, take us through your, your, your own journey okay. into dis di discovering that you, had, that you were depressed and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, it started about two years ago. I, I was basically enjoying my career and enjoying being in the limelight and all of that, all the things I could do to impact on people that look up to me. And I noticed that the things I used to find pleasure in, I stopped finding pleasure in. I got into a new relationship and it was abusive mentally and physically. And I think because that was my first experience, I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know who to talk to. So I, I just went into myself. And because it went on for quite some time, it really broke me down mentally. And it was something that was hard for me to shake because I was alone in it. I, I didn't have help. I was too ashamed to reach out to people and say, oh, he's hitting me and I'm hiding bruises and I'm lying about it all the time. And that was, it was just, it just took me on a downward spiral. And the more and more I tried to endure and fight it, the harder it became and it was like I was sinking, I was drowning and there was nobody to help me. Now, so how did it, how did you get to know that you were depressed? Okay, first I stopped, I stopped working. I stopped writing. I leave for writing and then I stopped writing. I didn't write for almost a year. I stopped going to work. I stopped going to events. I didn't want anybody to see me. I'd gained weight. And I this, was, your friend was, was there? He was there, but he didn't understand what I was going through. 
So he his reaction to it was negative because he has this typical Nigerian mindset that you have no reason to be depressed. You are beautiful. You have everything you want. Why are you saying you are sad? What's making you sad? You're doing this to yourself. So he couldn't understand it. And the more he made it seem like I was, I had, there was nothing wrong with me except myself, the more I sunk into it because I kept thinking, okay, now I have no reason to be sad. There's something wrong with me mentally. And so it took a while for me to accept until I had that experience, the attempt that it was like a wake-up call. And I knew that, listen, Karen, it's either you acknowledge this thing, you beat it, or you keep hiding, and then in the end, you probably would lose your life. You said to you had this attempt. Yeah. Can you spell it out so that our viewers know what you're talking I about? I tried to kill myself. I woke up one morning, and I had never felt so low in my life. Like, I could barely get out of bed, and... I spoke to my sister, I remember, but I tried to have a normal conversation Not, with her. Was anybody else at home? No, I was home alone. Okay. Um, I spoke to my sister and she just kept saying, you sound funny, what's wrong with you? But I didn't want to tell her because I didn't want anybody to stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I made up my mind. So I took a razor and I slipped my wrist. I was downstairs, but the doors were open because I leave, I have, I have neighbors who live in the same company as myself. And so because they hadn't seen me for a couple of, for like four days, and I was downstairs, I was bleeding out. At a point, I panicked. And I started thinking, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to die? But you'd already done it. They're, I'd already done it. And I knew it was getting too late. So I tried to get up. I tried to walk out to the kitchen, and then I collapsed. So apparently, that was where the, my neighbor's driver found me, because the blood had, like, soaked out from the kitchen floor and it's like once you walk into the compound, that's the first place you get to. So he saw and he he just and my car my car keys were hanging on a rack in the kitchen. So he just took the car keys, carried me into the car and started driving from different hospitals. They rejected me in about three hospitals because there was so much blood. They're like, no, 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 take us somewhere else. This is him telling me after I came to. And then finally one hospital in Lekki, they're like, you know what, this woman, if you take her somewhere else, she's gonna die. So they actually stitched me up right there in the lobby. And then... Stitched up? You cut the yes, artery? Yes, I cut an artery, yeah. So they stitched me up and they took me into a room. And then they tried to... I was not lucid enough to answer questions. So the guy went back to the house and got my wallet. So they saw emergency numbers. So they called my mom and my sister and they showed up. And it was just... When I woke up, I, I felt different. Did you feel lucky or happy to be alive? I felt I was amazed that I was alive because I saw, I literally looked dead in the face. Now, we're going to take a little break, but when we come back, we want to talk about how do people that are going through depression recognize when, it, when, when they still have time um, that they are actually suffering from depression and do something about it. So viewers, we'll be back with Karen in a moment. Stay tuned to The Heart of the Matter. Welcome back to The Heart of the Matter, where I'm talking with Karen Young about depression. Most of our viewers will look at you and say, how could she be depressed? In the same way, we see people every day, and some of them are going through depression, but, but it doesn't show. You don't have a mark on your forehead that says depression. So what are the kind of symptoms that people should look for, um, not only in themselves, but in others, that, that help them know that this person needs some kind of intervention before they, they do themselves harm? Okay, in oneself, I think the first thing is um, we draw, and in others, we draw from society. When the person doesn't want to be seen, stays indoors, doesn't want to like engage in any social, social activities, you start avoiding your friends, then you know, okay, there's something wrong. And then when you do not find pleasure in the things you used to find pleasure in. Everything that you used to do normally now seems like a chore. It's even something as simple as getting out of bed and taking a shower is like a chore. You don't want to do anything, you just want to stay. And then you start feeling sick, you fall sick like easily. In a week you could have a case of the flu like twice because your immune system is low. 
right because you're not at your peak performance and people don't understand how important your psyche is like it's like a physical illness it takes a toll on its toll on your body okay so now you've made a few points here in others yeah. what is it I mean, it's somebody suddenly stops doing the things that they, norm, they normally used to do. Um, they don't like going out anymore. So if you have a friend that, that, that suddenly displays those things, you know there's something. something. And I'm going to come back to you a little later and ask okay. how you can get an intervention for them. Okay. And then for you as an individual, you're looking at yourself and saying, but I used to enjoy writing and I haven't written anything for, for, for a year. Okay. So there must be something wrong. You, you just look at your life, something has changed. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yes. Now, if somebody concludes that they may be going through depression, what's the first thing they should do? I think the first thing they should do, if they have a, a supportive family, reach out to a family member, a sister, uncle, brother, or a best friend. I mean, my best friend played a huge role in helping me. Reach out to someone. But this was after the fact. This, this was is, before. But okay. I didn't tell her exactly the extent, but she knew I was the person. She kept okay. saying, I don't want you to be alone. Come and stay in my house. Like, just be around me. I can help you. But I felt I was beyond help. I just kept saying, you don't understand what I'm going through. Your life is perfect. So, Karen, you, you reached out to your friend. You reached out to your sister. Yeah. Um, what happened? Because you still went ahead yeah. with, with an attempt. Okay. Weren't they sensitive to understand what was going on? Um, my my friend was, like I till today I still tell her that to an extent I owe you my life. She's my best friend. She's former Miss Nigeria Muna Abi. Okay. Um, she understood what I was going through, and she did her best to help me. But I think as at the time I reached out to her, I was way too far gone in it, and because I had reached out to my family before and they didn't understand okay. what was wrong. They didn't, they didn't think I had any reason to be depressed. They didn't think I was even going to take it that far. They just felt, okay, she's just going through a phase because growing up, I've always had mood swings, like one minute I'm smiling, next minute I'm down. So they just felt, oh, Karen is being dramatic, drama queen. So they didn't take it that seriously until I did so, what so I did. So what would you advise somebody who, who suspects that they may be going through depression and they reached out to somebody and that person really doesn't understand, what do they do, reach out to somebody else? Or at what point do you think they should seek medical intervention? I think if you reach out to someone and they don't, they don't understand, it actually makes you feel worse, which is why I'm tempted to say reach out to a medical professional first. But sometimes, like in my case, when I was able to um, reach out to someone that was able to identify with what was going through, even if at that point I had I'd gone through such a downward spiral, it didn't do much good. But if you are lucky enough to recognize the symptoms on time, I think that's the best thing to do. Just, I mean, everybody close to you, you, you kind of know their personality. I think you should be able to guess this person might be more amenable to understanding. So talk to that person. And if the person doesn't get it, talk to somebody else. What if the person picks you up and says, we're going to the hospital right now. Then go. Don't resist. Go. Don't resist. Okay. okay, now, are there triggers? Are there things that can trigger somebody into a depression? And, and, and if you know some of the triggers, I mean, maybe you've looked at your life and seen what triggered you into depression. Could you tell us what the triggers could be? Yeah, there are some triggers, um, to the best of my knowledge, most times when you lose, lose someone, okay. you lose something important to you. Maybe you lose a loved one. Maybe you're in a relationship and it ends and maybe you're so dependent on the person. Or like I was, you're in an abusive relationship. It can do a lot. It just breaks down your psyche and it just makes you see yourself as less than you actually are. Um, if you lose a job, if you start having financial problems, there's so many. and now, I just realized that depression can also be hereditary because I'm still doing research on it so I can help more people. So sometimes it's actually hereditary. If your family has a history of depression, you might be more inclined to be depressed. Okay, so now what are the things that doctors do? I know you're not a medical doctor yourself, mm -hmm. but, but you, you, you've, you've obviously done a lot of research. Yes, I have. Um, what, 
what is the treatment for depression? Um, what they do, if it is something that is still in the early stages, counseling. They ask you what's going on, they talk to you, they monitor you. But if it's something that has gone beyond the early stages, like I had gone beyond, I had to have, I was put on the medication. So there are antidepressants that you take, but you still have to do counseling because the psychologist or psychiatrist has to monitor your progress. So you be given medication. Okay, now you just use the word the Nigerians don't like. Well, you use the word psychiatrist. Yes. When, when people hear psychiatrist, <laughs> they immediately think of the doctor that deals with lunatics. lunatics. Yes. Okay. Now, but that isn't the case. No, it's not. A psychiatrist is, is, is somebody that deals with normal people. Yes, issues okay. of the mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, even cases like dyslexia. Yes. You know, could, could, could need counseling. Yes. So, um, what would you say to people who are worried about the stigma that they think will be attached to them because of depression and because they are seeing a psychiatrist? Okay, I'll first say you have nothing to be ashamed of. First and foremost, if you do not change that mindset, you will be stuck in depression. Because when I was, when it was drowning me alive, it was when I was still, I was worried about what will people say, they would think I'm crazy, and asking myself, am I crazy? So I, I would tell anybody, do not feel any shame. Like, people's opinion of you is none of your business. It is their thoughts of you because you own your life. So you can be worried about what people will say, but if you're doing something that will preserve your life, save your life, please go ahead and do it. That's what I would say to them. Okay. Now, your story. You nearly died yeah. because you decided to slash your wrist. Yes. But thank God there was an intervention. Yes. You went into hospital. Yes. You came round from it. Yes. How did you now climb out of that black hole of depression? What's your story? How did you get back, looking back, so that if there's somebody who is having suicidal thoughts and hasn't done it, how can they climb out of that hole? I, I would say, after I left the hospital, I wouldn't say I was as depressed as I was when I went in, but I was still down because now it was like, where do I go from here? Now I've... I've lost literally almost everything. I lost my home, I lost my relationship, I'd stopped working, so I'd lost my job. I'd lost everything, so I'm like, where do I go from here? And I was still haunted by the visions of that violent thing I did to my body. I would close my eyes and I would see myself doing that and I would cringe, right? So I think the day I healed myself was the day I spoke out about it. Okay. That, that was the day I knew I was healed. So what was the day that you discovered that slashing your wrist was as a result of depression. As you went into the hospital, you didn't know that you were suffering from depression. But then you came around and somebody told you at some point yes. that this is it's, depression. Yes. How do you get to that point? I think it's um, a thing of the mind. You accept, I think, subconsciously. Did somebody actually ever say to you, this is depression? Yes, like, two people told me even before I got to, they're like, what's wrong with you? Are you depressed? Jokingly, mm -hmm. and then I'm like, nah, I'm just feeling a bit down these days. But because I was in denial, but until I had that experience I, when I tried to kill myself, and then the doctor sat me down, and he was really stern. He said, you have to accept this now. You are suffering from depression. You have nothing to be ashamed of. This is why you are doing these things you are doing to yourself. You are depressed, and you could lose your life if you don't get, get help. Okay. Now, your outlook has changed. Yes. You Very can good. go out now. You're beginning to, to you're, you're working. Yes. And all the things that were symptoms of depression have gone. Yes. We want to talk about that, but we're just going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in a moment. So, viewers, stay tuned to the heart of the matter, where we'll be back in a couple of minutes to talk to Karen Young. Welcome back, where we're talking to Karen Young about depression. Thank God it's way behind you now. Yes. And, and your, your, um, your, 
your raison d'etre, if you like, yes. is to get other people out of depression yes. Yes. or prevent people from slipping yes. into depression. Now, there was a Twitter incident yes. and, and people were condemning somebody. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, when I, because uh, when for he started early, but well, I wasn't on Twitter, and then I, um, I was going for a meeting, I was in a taxi when I was bored, I was in traffic, so I turned on my phone on Twitter and I saw what was going on. And I saw the condemnation and I, I empathized with the person. I knew, I'm like, this is exactly what I went through. But the difference is, I didn't, when I was going to do attempts mine, I didn't tell anybody, I just did it. But he, his, that his was a cry for help. So I knew that this was the time for me to speak out. So I went, I just started tweeting, like, I too have suffered, I too bear this cause. Because I was going to tattoo over them, but I'm like, no, I'm not ashamed. Of this, this will show that this is caused from my journey of life. I'm a survivor, and so I, I started talking about it. And I think that was the day I healed because immediately I sent my last tweet for the first time since this incident. I broke down in tears, mm -hmm. I was weeping in the back of the taxi. And the man is like, Madam, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine because I hadn't shed a tear all through this for over a year, no tears, just sadness. And I broke down in tears, and it was like I was just, something was just released out of me. And you were getting counseling at this stage? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, let's leave depression for a bit. Okay. Let's talk about Karen. Okay. Karen became a beauty queen at some point. Yes. But before you became a beauty queen, was that your vision? What did you want to do with your life? Well, being a beauty queen was, I never thought I would be at any point. I was going to work with either. Um, the Foreign Affairs Commission. Oh, I, was, I went to be an ambassador because I actually studied international studies and diplomacy. So I've always been interested in international affairs. So this is what I thought I was going to do. But the beauty queen was something that people I kept getting compliments. Oh, you're so pretty. You should contest. You should be a model. And I modeled for a bit. And then I'm from Delta State, and someone walked up to me and was like, listen, they're doing a beauty pageant. I want you to contest. Because I first contested in my university, so I was Miss Uniben. And I was fresh run up Miss Edo State, and then I went for Miss Delta State, and I won, and then I went for MBGN. So it was beauty parts of my life was something that just happened, and I just rolled with it. Is depression something that beauty queens or people in the modeling industry, etc., are, are really susceptible to? Is it something that? It's, I won't say really because I know a couple of people in that field. They are depressed because I think when you are, you, you're the goldfish. Yes, man. exactly. Looking yes, at your life. yes, and you are kind of isolated because you're elevated. You're a beauty queen, and most people that are around you are never around you genuinely, and then you don't even know who to trust because every most people are looking for a story. You want to tell them something that they take to the blogs, and the next thing you know, your business is out there. So you are actually kind of isolated, and then at the same time, there's a pressure to have this image. So you have to live up to this image that people want you to live up to. And it puts a lot of pressure on the human psyche. Okay. Now, Karen is out of all that. Yes. What's, what is the way forward? What, what are you doing next? What are you doing now? Okay. What do you plan to do okay. um, on, on this journey? Now, um, I have a um, foundation called African Women Rising. I'm s it's still in the works. I haven't finished yet because I know that it's going to take a lot. And the one thing that struck me was the reason why I started this foundation. There's no suicide helpline in this part okay. of the world. Yeah, because I remember one time, one night, I tried to Google suicide helpline, and there was none in Nigeria. So it's something I want to incorporate to my foundation. I want to have a foundation where people can go for counseling. Okay. I have spoken to some psychologists and psychiatrists that will be willing to contribute. Yes, and so people can go in for counseling, or there will be hotlines where you can call if you're feeling down and someone will talk to you. And also, I'm now into production and I'm trying to um, launch my first publication. So I'm very, I'm very busy these days, yes, and I'm happy about it because unlike before when I didn't want to do anything, now I have so much of my So you talk about launching your first publication. Yes. You're talking about a, a magazine, yes, a, a fashion book, magazine. a fashion magazine. Yes, and I have okay. my book coming out in okay. about six months. Yes. What's your book talking about? It's um it touches on different um different subjects in society. Depression is one of them. I wrote okay. a story. It's a collection of ten stories. I wrote one about my experience. I wrote one about politics. I wrote okay. one about prostitution. I wrote one about um corruption 
I, I like I wrote eleven different stories touching on different mm -hmm. subjects of like things that happen in this part of the world. Okay, and it's 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 coming out soon. Yes, in so a few viewers, months. Look out for that, <laughs> uh, Karen's book. Um, what's it called? It's called the book about nothing. The book about, about nothing. nothing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and then uh, you you the web uh, no it wasn't a website. You talked about the the. Um, foundation you're starting. Yes, foundation. It's called um, African Women Rising. Yes. Okay. Now, I know that there's a group in, in, in the UK called the Samaritans. Yes. Yeah. Um, they're on the phone. If you, if you run into trouble, you, you need help, yeah. especially things like suicide yeah. and all that kind of yeah. thing, you can pick up the phone. Yeah. So that's what you want to achieve. Yes. People picking up the phone, yes. calling somebody. Yes. Do we have the kind of people that, that can actually help somebody, that, have, that can understand and are able to to, to help somebody know exactly what to say. I believe that we do. I believe that we do because ever since um, what happened to me, I have gotten people that have reached out to me saying, listen, Karen, if you ever need any help with you, because I have made it clear that I'm going to do something, I'm going to take up. It's a fight I'm going to fight to um, make sure that depression is something that people are aware of. And there's been so many suicides daily. It's why we do recession, and it breaks my heart. And I think, okay, I want my foundation up and running. So these things don't happen. So there are people that understand this and, and can help those that are suffering from it. How bad is the suicide rate in Nigeria? It's terrible. It's terrible. It, um, I think last month there were five cases. Okay. And that is what five we Five cases know. in Nigeria? Or in in Nigeria. In okay. Nigeria. And I think th this is just, these five cases are the ones that we just know of. Mm -hmm. And then I, from the people I communicate with, because I'm... Um, some of them I leave strictly on email, and then ones where the cases are really bad, like there's this young girl that I know her, so was really, really bad. So some of them I give her my number and my email, so I talk to them daily. I talk to them on the phone, I talk to them on WhatsApp. So whenever they are feeling down or they just had a trigger, so they message me, and I, whatever I'm doing, I stop whatever I'm doing, and I take out a few minutes and I talk to them. That, that's, that's the compassion that, yeah. that comes from having been there, yeah. you know, like they say, being there. Uh, done, done it before. Being there, yes. got the, got the T-shirt. Yes. Um, so, so now you you are trying to get other people out of it. Yes. It's been such a pleasure having you on the heart of the matter, yeah. and um, uh, hopefully, um, if any viewers been going through depression, this would have lifted them up. They know what to do. Yeah. Get in touch with somebody. Get into an intervention yeah. and all that. Um, so we'll, we'll be delighted to see you again sometime yes. on the heart of the matter. Viewers, it's been fun bringing this episode to you. If you, I mean, there will be contact details on the screen if you want to get in touch with, uh, with, with Karen. You can get in touch with her. Um, we'll be back again next week with another episode of The Heart of the Matter. Until then, stay blessed.